Welcome to PAC TV Community News. I'm Brian Sullivan. And I'm Julie Thompson. This week on PCM, we stop by the National Marine Life Center in Buzzards Bay. We stop into Duxbury to check out the Citizens Police Academy, and we went on to Kingston for a town hall with Massachusetts Attorney General Mara Healy. We meet the Duxbury Police's new recruit, K9 Cirque, and we stop by Pembroke's Spring Fling Craft Fair. And we finish this show with Treasury Notes with Plymouth County Treasurer Tom O'Brien. But we start tonight's show in Plymouth. School can be somewhat stressful. Luckily, if you're a student or staff member at Plymouth Community Intermediate School, you now have Ansel. Ansel is a service dog who's trained to help kids and adults cope with stress by cuddling on demand and much more. PCN stopped by to learn more. There's 1,200 kids in the school. I don't even know, 100 teachers, um, maybe more. And uh, I would say the majority of the people that look at him every day are just happy to see him and smile every day so just being here um, has improved the lives I think of most of the people that he comes in con contact with. She's talking about Ansel, her assistance dog, tasked with comforting and assisting students and staff at Plymouth Community Intermediate School. Ansel joins a couple of other needs assistance dogs in the Plymouth schools. Needs is an organization that's been around about 40 years and they um, are very well known in internationally. Danelle says she learned about the NEEDS program when her daughter, who has a neuromuscular disease, got her NEEDS dog, Zeta. She was our first experience with a dog bringing joy and comfort to students. And I actually used her in my private practice for some students or kids or adults that had trauma or were having a difficult time sharing. They would use the dog to comfort them. Danelle says when she approached Principal Brian Palladino about having a NEEDS dog, he was totally on board. The therapeutic value of the dog is, is it tends to calm people down. Um, it can lower your blood pressure. It can increase the neurotransmitters to your brain, the feel-good trans you know, transmitters. Um, so being around an, a calm animal or a loving animal or a comforting animal can really increase people's benefit of um, relaxation and feeling more comfortable. In colleges, they use the dogs for um, helping kids with their stress before exams, things like that. So that was the whole idea. Um, I work with a population, primarily a population of students who struggle with emotional issues or uh, anxiety, depression, school phobia, uh, fears, things like that. So the, the dog was gonna be a natural fit for the population that I work with. Uh, but I also feel really strongly about having the dog in a school setting in general for the general population because in today's environment, um, there's so much negativity. So having this dog here uh, has brought smiles to everybody's faces, everybody loves the dog, uh, makes kids happy to see the dog just walking by. So I just think it's, it's adding to the culture of the school, making it a much more positive place for kids to come. What he's been able to do with kids in a short period of time really is amazing. Um, he's in a, in a program where uh, kids who may be struggling really have an opportunity to kind of spend some time and, and it really does change their day. Um, so it's been great. I can't say enough about having him here um, just as, as, as part of the staff. I, I, I kind of think of him as a, as a staff member here, uh, you know, almost like a little therapist that uh, has four legs. As a school district, in a school, we got to start thinking outside the box on how to support kids. Um, and this is, this is a perfect example of that. Danelle is currently raising funds to offset the cost of the training Ansel received through the NEEDS program. Reporting in Plymouth for PAC-TV Community News, I'm Walter Cicchetti. The mission of the National Marine Life Center in Buzzards Bay is to rehabilitate and release stranded marine mammals and sea turtles in order to advance science and education in marine wildlife, health and conservation. This aquatic animal hospital opened in 1995 and is open to stranded and injured sea creatures 365 days a year. The visitor center is open to the public from Memorial Day to Labor Day. We dropped in when some stranded baby seals were being admitted to bring you this story. Hiding in plain sight on Main Street in Buzzards Bay is one of the more unique animal hospitals on the East Coast. Behind these frosted windows are creatures not found in your local petting zoo. In fact, this is the only place for miles that some of these animals can be taken in, and all of them are here with the intention of being released back into the wild as soon as they're ready. This is the one spot along the New England shoreline from Maine all the way down to Rhode Island that actually takes in sick and abandoned seals. The next closest spot is the Mystic Aquarium in Connecticut. 
we care for these animals with the intent of releasing them back to the wild and in doing so we have a great opportunity to educate. We educate over 12,000 students a year and also do the science. So I like to say science starts here. This is where you start documenting and then scientists can actually create hypotheticals and decide what kind of research is required. During our visit, we were able to see some of the seal pups as they were being fed. These are relatively new arrivals, and since they haven't developed teeth yet, they're tube fed. This is a five times per day process, which starts at seven in the morning and finishes up at 11 o'clock at night. Pups, they don't know how to eat just quite yet, so these guys that, that you've seen earlier today are about a week or so old, so they should still be nursing with their, with their mother. Um, for whatever reason, they were separated, uh, so we don't always know the cause of that. Sometimes the mom just leaves them a little bit too early. Sometimes human interaction can cause the mom to separate from the baby a little bit too early. So because of that, we have to sust or sustain them uh, through tube feeding and give them the nutrients they need to bulk them up until they're ready to start learning how to eat fish. So that's the tube feeding process. We were also there for the admission of two other baby seals. The interns and volunteers taking care of this procedure do so in a manner that's very quick and efficient because they not only need to keep the interaction between human and animal to a minimum, but these seals were under duress upon their arrival. So the quicker, the better. For these pups especially, they came all the way down from Maine this afternoon. So they had about a four hour drive just to get here. So that in itself is pretty stressful on them. So we do everything we can to uh, make the admit process as smooth and uh, minimize stress as possible. So the way we do that is just being very efficient with the work that we do. So moving through the whole admit process from the blood draw to taking temperature, uh, getting our samples and doing the physical exam as quickly as we can. Um, and then also minimizing um, any audible stress or um, physical stress on them. So just trying to breeze through efficiently for them. On the back wall of the visitor center, closed circuit cameras are set on several of the tanks in the hospital. They're filled with fresh ocean water every day from the canal just behind the building. During this visit, the tanks house not only seals, but sea turtles who go through a similar admission process just during a different time of year. With the turtles, they typically come in a lot more critical. They come in during the cold, stunning season in late uh, fall, early winter, um, so they're often very hypothermic and very critical state. As fun as these animals may be for outsiders to look at, they're here for scientific purposes, with the end result being that they eventually get released back into the ocean that they came from. The National Marine Life Center rehabilitates stranded marine mammals um, in order to carry out education and um, science in its pursuits for saving these animals. And we teach conservation. In Buzzards Bay, I'm Brian Sullivan for PCN. That was wonderful, Brian. And who doesn't love a baby seal? It they're was, just so cute. It was so hard not to be distracted by the yeah. fact that they're so adorable. Even the adult seals are adorable. They also have sea turtles, but they take in all kinds of uh, sea animals. and. Um, they're actually, even though they're only open to the public uh, during the summer months, yeah. they have other programs for people during the year. So I feel like I should mention that yeah. as well. You know, I think they have a thing for a Girl Scouts badge sure. and a couple other sure. things. And adults, if they want to do some kind of adult education, they have it during usually the February and April breaks. So Great. What a wonderful story. The Duxbury Police Station held a Citizens Academy event where specialty and regional units got to come in and talk with the citizens and give them an understanding about what unique things they do and how their equipment works. PCN stopped in to get the story. Like we have eight of them. Today is one of the sessions of our Citizens Academy. And the focus of today's event is on the specialty units, regional units. You know, it's a uh, giving them an understanding of what regionalization is about and, you know, sort of how it benefits uh, the residents in the community of Duxbury. You know, we, uh, you know, we sort of, we provide to other communities when, when uh, the units need to go out, but uh, when, when the bell rings in Duxbury, uh, those folks give back to us with their, you know, specially trained folks and equipment that come in and, and they assist us with whatever our extraordinary event is. Uh, members of the SWAT team are out here today and showing the equipment and uh, just explaining uh, sort of beyond just the capabilities, but uh, we discussed a little bit about the vetting process as to when the unit is used and is not used, kind of an important uh, topic. 
and uh, sort of give them an understanding of what that, that process is. Uh, you know, we, we take that very seriously as to uh, how that type of a, a, uh, an asset is, is utilized. They're having a, a, a walkthrough of the command center and some of the staff from the command center are showing them how the equipment works, the capabilities, there's camera systems, there's, oh, there's a, you know, a whole host of, of uh, interoperability equipment in there for tie-in radio systems and also their, their drone unit. They're doing a drone demonstration. Uh, the drone unit is sort of tied to uh, the command truck. And so they're getting a look at that, the capabilities of the drone. So just giving a, a quick overview of uh, a lot of those additional assets that, that we have available to us. Well, the Citizens Academy in general, you know, it's, we've, it's been a fantastic tool over the years to you know, have some residents come in and take a look at what, what we're all about, what they're spending their tax dollars on. I want them to feel comfortable that you know, we're good guardians, we're being reasonable, but we're also making sure that we're prepared. There's an expectation that we're going to provide a certain level of service, and there's an expectation that when extraordinary events do occur, that, you know, that we have a plan in place and that we have the capable assets and resources and skilled individuals to come and deal with that. So I think that you know, it gives them a good overview of what their basic community policing services are about in this town, what their police department is about. We want them to be comfortable and, and confident that uh, you know, they can feel good that their, the local police department is on their game. Well, today we're just doing a demonstration for the citizens of Duxbury about the capabilities of the Metrolec uh, Regional Dive Team. It's an organization that we stood up two years ago where we're sharing resources amongst all our coastal communities and uh, we can provide diving and boat response and emergency services that are water related for the Metro Elect region. And during the demonstration, I showed uh, the type of equipment so that we can communicate underwater with our divers while they're doing a recovery operation or while they're doing a search. So it's very highly specialized. It was paid for through uh, grants from the U.S. government. And so we're sharing our resources with any requesting agency that is looking for police diving services. Just to, you know, to have folks understand who these people are that are serving, I want them just to be comfortable. Um, and I, you know, I think we put a lot of emphasis on that, and, and I hope that that's what we're achieving. What's that? We're great. Yeah, oh, yeah. Clean. Yeah. 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 And optics again. Town hall events are held to allow the public to ask questions of their elected representatives and give them the chance to have the face-to-face -face they likely wouldn't get in any other setting. The Kingston Democratic Town Committee hosted one such event recently with the state's Attorney General Maura Healy as the guest speaker. We're at the Kingston Intermediate School tonight and we're all joining Attorney General Maura Healy to really get folks engaged, um, really just civic engagement, um, in the democratic process. Um, we're excited here. Um, the entire Kingston Democratic um, Town Committee is here and we are looking to just get folks in a room in person to talk about the issues that matter most to everyone. The Town Hall Forum is a chance for, in, in this model, we have an elected official here to give some remarks, offer some remarks about their perspective, what they have seen achieved so far and where we're going. And then we have the majority of the focus and the time here will be spent on allowing folks in the community, not just Kingston, but also the surrounding towns, to come out and say, you know, I have a question on what you're doing with this issue and I'd like to know more about it. Or here's an idea I have, have you tried this? Um, and really have face time with elected officials who otherwise may just seem a little bit, you know, distant where you know, you can't get to every city and town every day. So this is a big deal for our Kingston Democratic Town Committee to be, you know, welcoming a, a constitutional officer here in our, you know, in our Kingston Intermediate School for, you know, an event that, you know, quite frankly, we haven't run for quite some time. We're really trying to energize a younger demographic of voters. Wherever you're, you know, wherever you're coming from, whatever your perspective, whatever your you know, your stances on any issue. We really just want folks to be engaged. Um, it's important that folks come out to give her, you know, a new perspective as well. She doesn't want to hear the same old, you know, she doesn't want to preach to the choir. This is enormously important to me, especially, I feel like this is, this is really a year where we're ramping up for another election. Um, and, you know, we're often finding people are online and they're engaged in 
sometimes very emotional, but when it comes to being face to face with folks, um, people don't always necessarily speak their mind the same way. So this is a chance to be very courteous, very respectful, but also very informed. And if you feel like you don't have the answers, you can come and ask those questions to the folks here who, if they don't have them, they'll get them for you. The newest member of the Duxbury Police Department is a great hunter and he can sniff out a missing person with ease. This four-legged member of the force is a canine named Cirque and he's currently in a 16-week training program. PCN went to the Duxbury Police Station to meet this wonderful new recruit. The uh, Duxbury Police Department canine unit dates back to the early 80s. We've had a consistent unit for you know, well over 30 years and. Um, and Cirque is just the, uh, the latest addition to our canine team. We acquired Cirque from a, a breeder down in Pennsylvania, and that organization imports animals from around the world after they've screened them. And Cirque is actually a native of Budapest, Hungary, and he arrived here with his own passport. And he spent some time in, in Pennsylvania doing some training, and now he's, he's started his uh, in-house training here, which is a 16-week program. The canine program here has been sustained for uh, quite some time, uh, not through really the, the police operating budget. It's been through the generosity of the, the residents of the town. We do fundraisers, um, and when uh, it was time uh, for a new canine, we just made one simple appeal to the community, and the support was really overwhelming. And those funds, along with some uh, grants that that Officer Hall was able to obtain is completely funding uh, the program and we have some sustaining funds now. You know, we support other communities when they have an extraordinary event. What are some of the highlights of uh, canines in the past here? Uh, it goes back to, to Canine Czar, who was one of a handful of tactical dogs that worked in Watertown the day uh, of the arrest after the Boston Marathon bombing. So, uh, and some of our other canines uh, have worked uh, routinely working some of the, the major events in, in Boston. We've been on hand for when the Red Sox win the World Series and the, the Patriots uh, have won and uh, there are some you know, crowd control or order maintenance needs up there. Uh, you know, we're a part of that, but at the same time, locally, you know, we'll assist our neighbors with if, if they have an autistic child that's, that's gone among the missing or uh, Alzheimer's patient, uh, you know, something to that effect. The chief said, hey, you got the job and you know, I took the trip and now I'm in, now I'm in training. I haven't been here for about three weeks. I've been going to uh, different places and doing training. Um, and it's a lot, it's a lot, a lot of work, um, but it's very rewarding. Uh, the families, they love them. So the kids, uh, kids play with him out back. You know, he's just uh, like a regular dog at home. He's gonna be a great asset to, uh, to Duxbury, um, mainly due to his, uh, his tracking ability. You know, when he does a good job, it's, it's, it's an awesome feeling. A lot of pride in that, you know. Um, and if he has a bad day, you, you feel it, even if it's not your fault, um, you know, because he's a dog, and dogs, just like humans, have bad days and good days. The Pembroke Firehouse Food Pantry had a vendors and craft fair to support the pantry and help those in need. There was also a raffle to help support the pantry. PCN stopped in to get you this story. Today we're holding a vendors and craft fair to support the pantry. Every $50 that we raise buys one ton of food. Last year we did it for the first time and we raised over $35,000. This year we're hoping to exceed that amount of money. These families can come to us and know that they'll be treated with respect uh, and we will make sure they have enough of food to last them for the week and help them with their needs. The Firehouse Pantry helps people all over Pembroke and people in Hanson, so it really does a lot for the community. And it's not just the food part of it, but it's the community part of it. Like the people that volunteer at the pantry um, have a really good community um, feel to it. And I think when people come into the pantry, they're not intimidated or anything. They feel um, it's like a safe place so they can come in and get food. All of my volunteers here are fabulous. The co-directors are fabulous. We're just doing our best to help people. This is our second year as a spring fling. Um, we hope to hold it every year, and last year we made $5,000, and 
Do the math. $50 buys one ton. And thank you to everybody who supports the pantry. We're having a fantastic time here with the music and the vendors and all the raffle items and the 50-50. They actually want to do it more frequently than annually. Um, so I can't just say it's enough, it's fun. The pantry services, it, it has three outreach arms. Um, so the biggest one, as most people know, is the six to 700 families uh, it feeds weekly and monthly. Um, both in town and out of town residents, but primarily in town. Um, we also, on a weekly basis, bring groceries to our three senior communities. Right now we're at two senior communities, but we'll hopefully we'll get back to three. And um, there's an outreach to Brockton where we bring lunch to the homeless uh, weekly. I volunteer a lot at the food pantry, so uh, for them to have monetary availability to support the community as the community supports us uh, is very much appreciated by everyone. We are so pleased to have back on set today Tom O'Brien, who is the Plymouth County Treasurer for our section of this program, which we call Treasury Notes with Tom O'Brien. Welcome back. It's great to be here. It's great to have I'll you. I always look forward to this segment. And we look forward to having you. We learn something new every time. Let's just do a quick review of county government. There's a lot of people that still don't understand the whole entity of why do we have county government and how many counties are there in the state. Let's well, and it gets start with that. It gets confusing for the reason that you mentioned. They say, huh, I thought we didn't have some counties and we have some counties. Yes. Here in Massachusetts, there are 14 geographic areas known as counties. Mm -hmm. uh, in the late 1990s, uh, seven of them were taken away. Mm -hmm. Seven of them remain. One of those seven is just the city of Boston. Okay. That's Suffolk County. So we kind of consider themselves their own entity, yes. their own enterprise. Yep. Uh, and then we have the six active, flourishing county governments, predominantly here in southeastern Massachusetts. Let me just interrupt. So the seven that are no longer counties, they could be, but they have just selected or chosen not to have county government anymore? Well, the choice wasn't theirs. The okay. choice was decided by the Massachusetts state legislature. Okay. Uh, they passed legislation that said that they would be assimilated into the state. The problem with that is that the trend over the last 10 years and into the future is regionalization of government services, enterprises, right. and resources. Exactly. And so what happened is in those seven counties where county government was taken away from them, they have tried to band together mm -hmm. to reform a regional government. Some of them are looking at recreating a county through yep. the statute, but the quickest way they can do it, because the statute allows it, is create themselves as what's called a council of government or a cog. Okay. And the difference between a cog and a county yep. is that the county is envisioned and created in the statute. Mm -hmm. So we follow the state Certain law, yep. and it's mm -hmm. already there, and it outlines exactly what we can and can't do. Yes. A COG is communities getting together yep. and signing agreements with each other to provide services they're, as a combined entity. They're banding together and almost pretending they're a county. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I've never heard it said that way, but that's exactly correct. Okay, and they're doing it for the right reasons. They wish they were a county. Right, they're doing it for the right reasons. They're doing it absolutely for the right reasons. And one of the biggest reasons that county government is wonderful is the ability to bulk purchase. It, it is predominantly the best resource that we s provide to our citizens other than those services that we have done historically like the Registry of Deeds and Courthouses. Yes. Those are clearly invaluable. It's something that we do very well. Right. <laughs> we have 300 years under our belt, so we should be doing it well. Right. Uh, but bulk purchasing is where we can directly impact our communities and save them money and resources and time. So in the past, what are some of the big bulk purchasing programs that you have offered to cities and towns? So the biggest one we offer is a municipal vehicle bid. Yep. Uh, and that's offered to not just the communities in Plymouth County, but every community in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts okay. and in New England. We actually have communities from Rhode Island, Vermont, Maine, purchasing their municipal vehicles through and us. And that's police cruisers, ambulances, it fire? It is predominantly public safety vehicles. Okay. We are going to be looking to expand that out. But yes, police cruisers and, and some fire equipment and okay. uh, fire trucks, but predominantly police cruisers. And you're saying towns a lot of money by being able to bulk purchase these items. A town in uh, Plymouth County just purchased five cruisers and they saved anywhere between uh, ten to fifteen thousand dollars. Wow that's great. Just by purchasing through us as right. opposed and why to not? You're getting this exact same vehicle. <laughs> you are and we handle a lot of the paperwork for you. Okay. So why plus. not do that? Okay. Um, we have a few other smaller bids. We do a fuel oil bid. I don't think people know enough about that mm -hmm. because let me tell you we got our price on our fuel oil bid and my goodness I wish I could get that price for myself. 
I know communities are overpaying for the fuel oil mm -hmm. because they don't know about our bid. And mm -hmm. shame on us, we have a hard time of getting that information Messaging. out right. to people, uh, largely because they don't know what we do. Right. So this is a chance to let them know. So that's another one. There are a few other smaller ones we do, okay. but the one that people know is a municipal vehicle bid. Okay. And today, for the first time, you're going to announce a brand new bulk purchasing program that you have identified, go. <laughs> <laughs> well, so what Plymouth County did is we recognized there are things we do well in bulk purchasing. Yep. And we had meetings with the Hampshire Council of Government, Hampshire COG. Okay. And we found out that they had a uh, educational supplies bulk purchase bid that they did, that they've been doing for a number of years now, mm -hmm. that is recognized as the most successful in Massachusetts and probably in the region. And so we entered into negotiations with them to see if we could piggyback on their good idea. Yeah. Uh, and the commissioners on May 31st signed a memorandum of agreement with the Hampshire Council and Government to provide this bulk purchasing contract services to the communities in Plymouth County. Wow, so any school, school system, school district, once they know about this, <laughs> yes. can go through the Plymouth County Commissioner's, Commissioner's office, office correct. to get bulk purchasing power for school supplies. School supplies and educational materials. Wow. Yes. And so what, and I'm hoping that people that are watching are saying, oh, I really want my town to do this or at least investigate this. Sure. Because some of them are, all of them are trying to save money. Of course. And they're joining whatever they feel is the best. And, and they are doing that to the best of their ability, but they don't know about this because it's so new. And the supply budget is one that's really being cut in a lot of towns. I know two of our towns, that was one of the big things to cut, it was the supply budget. So when you say that it's it's school supplies or, or supplies- Paper, that, pens, pencils, erasers, notebooks. Right, so it's not textbooks. It, it, you have nothing to do with that. We don't. Right. Uh, textbooks are governed by state and federal statute sure. and there are things that have to be uh, <laughs> paid attention to in terms of detail yes. and what can be in the textbook. Yep. No, this is just general school supplies and educational materials, notebooks, yep. uh, other things are available through this bulk purchase bid. We were surprised at how uh, successful this bid is and how low the prices really are. Yep. Um, so if somebody is interested because they're watching this yeah. and saying, hey, this will be good for my school uh, and help us save some money. And as you say, towns are crimping on their budget oh, every sure, chance sure. they get. Uh, and this is an area where they're doing that. They should call the county administrator, Frank Basler, yep. at 508-830-9104. Okay, so Frank Basler's in charge of this entire program as far as getting working with the schools. Th that's correct. Now, is it an individual school? Like, I, I am the principal in elementary school. I want to do this. Or do I have to go through my school system, my school district? So it makes sense to do it through your town sure. because... If there is one school that can benefit, they all can benefit. Absolutely. And then that town gets a bigger benefit right, from right, doing it together. Right. Um, however, we'll accommodate anybody that sees a need and wants to do this. Okay. I think it would be hard for one school to do it because they're right. part of a bigger budget. Yep. Um, but it, it will do whatever any community needs. If they just want to test it out on one, one component. You can try it. If they right. just want to order pencils. Yep. Let's do it. Now, do schools have to do the request for bid? Do they have to? No, that's they the advantage. Beautiful. They can sign up with us yep. uh, because we have the authority to do this. We vetted everything. Hampshire Cog has vetted things through uh, their creation of the program. Okay, and they've so, done it for a few years. And they've done it for a number of years now. Okay. I think at least three, maybe even yep. longer. Uh, so they've worked out the, the bugs. The kinks. Yeah, the they've kinks worked of the program, out the kinks. Right. Uh, and we had a chance to meet with them, review their program, and we see an opportunity for significant savings. We actually looked at one town's budget and saw what they spent on school supplies. Mm -hmm. We got a breakdown as much as we could. We compared it with on the bid list in this one town, although it's a bigger town, will save if they simply join our bid list and buy what they're buying for school supplies now mm -hmm. with us, save mm -hmm. $7,500. Wow. Wow, and that, that's a lot and of And so money. what do you get to do with that savings? Buy more school supplies. Right. So if you're... Or put it into another program. <laughs> or put it into another program. you had to cut or hasn't been funded. Absolutely And correct. right now, the vendor that you're working with for this program is WB Mason that's, at this point. That's time. correct. The vendor that they have, and they have to go out to bid every few years. Sure. So the vendor's WB Mason, a yep. name that people know. Absolutely. And are familiar with yeah. and are comfortable He's with. He's local, yep. And, and they have been very good about uh, coming in at at low prices to be able to get the business and keep the business going. So right. uh, we just see this as a real opportunity right. and a credit to the county commissioners for putting this program That's right. on and the table for the community. And it's another important county. thing that county government offers. So uh, good luck getting the word out and any way we can help you do that. Great. That's well, wonderful. thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Until <laughs> next time. And a new subject. We'll, we'll bring a new subject every time. Okay.
Thank you for watching. If you want to see the show again, you can check out our website and PCN is also on YouTube. Be sure to follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook to get up-to-date info. We will see you next week with a brand new PCN. From all of us at PAC-TV, have a great week.